Hey guys, welcome back to Bayesian. So it looks like I didn't scare all of you off with the very philosophical lecture last time. Uh, so I do appreciate uh, those of you who have um, viewed the lecture. Um, I, I do appreciate that. I think uh, in general, it works better when there's an audience, when there's more of a back and forth and uh, not me just staring at myself in the corner, and, um, uh, you know, reading the slides to you. And I think I, I really want to try and avoid doing that today. Um, I don't intend for this to be a long lecture. Uh, we're going to talk about Bayesian information criteria specifically, uh, DIC, Deviance Information Criteria, and WAIC, uh, Watanabe Akaike Information Criteria. Those are both pretty widely used. Um, last time we talked about uh, the kind of the philosophy of what information criteria are trying to do in general, and we went over frequentist information criteria. Um, so make sure and uh, look at the previous lecture if you uh, missed it. So the DIC, I covered it very briefly um, last time. Just want to do a quick review since we are in a Bayesian class after all. It's modeled heavily against the AIC. It even has a very similar formula. If you compare the formula of the um, DIC with the formula of the AIC, it, it really um, is modeled against the AIC. Right, we have the two times the number of effective parameters. One of the things I was trying to show you guys last time was all the ways in which you could get in trouble, or at least one way you could get in trouble in trying to compute these effective parameters. And um, I will show you yet another way today. So the DIC has been um, very widely used. The original paper has been cited over 10,000 times. But it does make some strong assumptions, um, sort of like its uh, frequentist counterpart, the AIC. It assumes that posterior is approximately normal and that you have a lot of data relative to the things you're trying to estimate. That is a strong assumption. Um, you could probably assume that most posteriors come out at least approximately normal, at least approximately normal. But um, the fact that you have a lot more information than you have the parameters you're trying to estimate, this doesn't jive with most modern analysis tasks. Uh, we ask very complicated questions in the modern world because we have really cool models now uh, and, and we'd like to take them out for a drive and answer really complicated questions. So it's not the case in the 1950s when the AIC was being um, introduced. Depending on, depending on how you specify your priors, the effective number of parameters can be ridiculous, like we did last time. It was something like 150 for a model that clearly had four, or it could even be negative. So you really have to watch, your, watch yourself. When you fit a model, take a look at what the model thinks is the effective number of parameters. If that is really far off from what you're actually trying to do, it's a very good time. It's a really good indicator to take a look at your priors. And we end up computing the DIC at a point estimate. So the, say the posterior mean. And so uh, it has been criticized for not truly being a Bayesian criteria. So um, about, oh, 10 years after uh, the DIC was popularized comes um, the Watanabe Akaike information criteria. Sumia Watanabe is, in, uh, was, is on, our, on our slide. Um, he didn't name the criteria after himself. He, he is uh, uh, far more sensible than that. Um, I believe he called it the widely applicable information criteria. Uh, and this one really is fully Bayesian uh, because it uses every single one of our MCMC samples and um, it uses every single one of our observations. So, that is why people say the WAIC is fully Bayesian, whereas the DIC is not. It also therefore does not assume that the posteriors are approximately normal. Or another way this is written sometimes is, is that the posterior is well represented by the mean, which is what the DIC implicitly assumes. The look is very similar. We have something that is sort of a raw goodness of fit. And we have a penalty term, which depends on the effective number of parameters. But of course, 
uh, the formula is different and the formula to compute the effective number of parameters will be different. And by the way, I'm deliberately trying not to read the slides to you guys because um, I, I, I think it gets really boring. And uh, if, if there is something super specific in the slides, uh, go ahead and reach out. Um, I can try and answer that. Uh, but in terms of me reading the slides to you, I, I, I really don't think this is what these videos are supposed to be. Even if I was uh, delivering this in front of a live studio audience, I wouldn't be reading the slides back to you. So the key with the WAIC is that we um, notice that we have two colored, um, two sets of colored indices. We do something over all the observations and we also do something over all of our MCMC samples. So what we do is we average the likelihood for each observation, right? This is that we average the likelihood for each observation over the entire set, right? So this is the average likelihood for each observation over all MCMC, whoa. MCMC samples. That just, just does not want to write today. There it is. And then we sum it all up over all n observations. So for each observation, we take an average over our entire posterior, and then we add up the posteriors over all n observations. Remember, um, pretty early on, we figured out how to combine different posteriors together. Um, so this is not that different. But the key is we have a sum and we have an average. And it uses the entire posterior distribution to compute the WAIC as opposed to the DIC that only uses a single Bayesian point estimate. The number of effective parameters, well, it's known to be um, more, more, uh, more stable and is strictly positive, strictly positive because we find a variance of something. Um, if you remember the DIC effective parameters could be negative and that doesn't make a ton of sense. This sums up the variances of each of our um, log likelihoods. So the, in a WAIC world, the number of effective parameters is tied to uncertainty in our log likelihood. But we have a sum of sums, right? We have a sum here. We have a sum over n here. So again, by the way, uh, again, look at the uh, sort of modeled against, modeled closely uh, on the AIC and the DIC. Smaller values indicate a, a better model in that uh, a lower, out of sample, out of sample error, predictive error. That's why we select uh, models with small DIC and small WAIC values. But one thing that WAIC has that other information criteria don't, and this includes all the frequentist information criteria and the DIC, we get a sum of n things. And therefore, because we have an, a sum of n things, we can compute the standard error of the difference between two um, AICs. We can compute a standard error of the difference between any two WAICs. So um, in a frequentist world, you see people saying, OK, well, here is model one, and my AIC is you know, a million. Uh, a million and five. And then here is model two, and its AIC is a million 
and I hope that's a million and one. And because the AIC for model two is lower than that of um, AIC of model one, I'm gonna select um, model two. In the WAIC world, you can actually put a standard error on that difference. Is that a difference of four points on this you know, uninterpretable scale? How, and I'm really trying not to use the word significant, but how meaningful is that difference given the uncertainty inherent in the two models? And I'm avoiding the word significant because Dr. Gelman tells us to not treat it like a t-test, not to look at a difference of the two WAICs and go, oh, I know, uh, if it's greater than 1.96, I call my model significantly better and I can go to sleep happy. Don't do that because asymptotic normality or asymptotic T distribution is not guaranteed. It has not been shown yet to my knowledge. But that being said, if you can show that your one model is three standard errors better than your other model, then you can say, hey, that's a very big improvement in predictive performance. You can even say, hey, this uh, WAIC is lower and it's lower by about one standard error. You know what? One standard error difference where the WAIC is lower is nothing to sneeze at. If you're building um, a bunch of models and they're all different by say within 0.1 standard errors, it really doesn't matter. They're all essentially equivalent. Remember, the uh, different model specifications can lead to essentially the same predictive performance. So if you have a bunch of models that are virtually identical, the difference in the WAICs is, you know, I don't know, within half a standard, a standard error or thereabouts, I don't know. Go and pick, go ahead and pick the one that's most interpretable. Go ahead and pick the one that uh, has the greatest scientific meaning. You know, you don't have a ton of evidence to say, hey, I'm gonna pick this model because it is just expected to be so much better in a predictive sense. So WAIC, you can actually find the standard error of the difference between two information criteria. It is not a silver bullet not a silver bullet. It is still just an approximation of cross-validation error. It will give you a warning if one of those variances, if one of these variances is greater than 0.4. And we'll see that in just a sec. Um, and, and, and that's because it's been shown that uh, the, the effective number of parameters formula can fail if that's the case. Um, in my experience, it hasn't caused uh, any sort of meaningful difference in the interpretation, uh, but I can't speak uh, you know, for every possible uh, analysis out there. Implicitly, because we sum over observations, right? Look, we sum over observations here. We sum over observations here. We implicitly assume that conditional on the parameters, our observations are independent. Conditional on the parameters, our observations are independent. I'm aware that there is work happening to apply the WAIC to spatial and temporal data that are inherently correlated. So there's some question as to how accurate the WAIC is uh, in spatial and spatial temporal and time series analysis. And uh, our fine author, Dr. Gelman, uh, writes in his paper that uh, he and his team are frustrated because all existing inform information criteria have their flaws. So I hope that the last two lectures, if, they, if you've taken away nothing, is learn about the information criteria and select the one you can live with. If, if you're in a Bayesian world, the WAIC is tending to be the default. But if you're dealing with a spatial data set, if you're dealing with a time series analysis, um, pause. Doesn't mean it's invalid, just pause. And uh, maybe go out in Google Scholar and see how others have treated WAIC in, with correlated data. If you don't have correlated data, the WAIC is a really, really good way to go. It makes fewer assumptions. 
it makes fewer assumptions. Where's my first slide? It makes fewer assumptions than the DIC does. It's fully Bayesian and it gives you a standard error of the difference. So it serves as a really nice default if you have uncorrelated data or data that are uncorrelated conditional on, on the parameters. So I have a, a sort of an example here. I will leave it uh, to you guys because I, I don't want to read off the slides. I will, however, flip into R and show you some things about some cautionary tales about how information criteria and effective parameters behave. Remember, in a frequentist world, there are no effective parameters, with the exception of multi-level models. But there are no uh, effective parameters with the kinds of models we've dealt with. You simply count how many coefficients you're estimating, and that is how many parameters you're estimating. In a Bayesian world, your parameters have distributions. And those distributions can be more uncertain or less uncertain, right? Those are the posterior distributions. Even more importantly, you, the analyst, can input a certain prior precision into these distributions, and that can be quite arbitrary. So here uh, in R, I've gone through, through the case where I get a reasonable number of effective parameters, four and a half, even though I'm still, I'm estimating one, two, three, and four, and these are fairly reasonable priors. Last time, I ended with a set of ridiculous priors. Recall that um, the normal distribution in JAGS, I'm looking at JAGS, by the way. So this is a Gibbs sampler. These are parameterized in terms of the precision. So this is actually a teeny tiny prior standard uh, variance, excuse me. This too is a very small prior variance, very small prior variance. However, this made something like 150 effective parameters. So now I want to show you that it's not just the prior standard deviation or prior variance that makes a difference. What I'm doing with this set of priors here, I am deliberately putting my priors in conflict with the data. I'm not quite invalidating my data because I still have enough observations in this heights data set uh, that my likelihood overwhelms my priors. I have enough data to sort of update my priors sufficiently to get the right answers. But data tells us men are taller than women and that weight is positively associated with height. These are very reasonable and expected results. But look what I'm doing. Here is the weight coefficient. I am setting a normal prior where the mean is minus 10. I'm deliberately putting it reversing the, the sign there. And here is the male uh, kind of dummy variable coefficient. Should be positive because men are taller than women on average. Here, I'm making the prior be centered at minus 10. Again, trying to put my prior in conflict with my data. Notice that my prior variances did not change. These are, these are the same as with the good priors example. So let me run this. All righty. Nice and quick. Very cool. All right. So I've taught you to look at the R hats. I've taught you to look at the uh, trace plots. I've taught you to look at the effective sample sizes, the trace plots, chubby caterpillars. That's a thumbs up. R hats, all near one. That's a thumbs up. Effective sample sizes, all very healthy, uh, except for maybe this one, still over a thousand. That's a thumbs up. Those are three thumbs up. We're doing great, right? Except JAGS claims that we're trying to estimate 7.9 effective parameters, where I can count on one hand, I'm estimating one, two, three, four. Remember, I didn't touch the prior variances. I only touched the prior means for my two coefficients, trying to put my priors in conflict with my data. So what's the overarching lesson? Run your model, check your effective parameters. If it's a, a value you're uncomfortable with, I was comfortable with a four and a half. I am uncomfortable with a 7.9. That's almost twice as much. Check your priors.
You could have th thought you were centering you and you're not centering. You could have just made a typo. You could have forgotten uh, the, that things are sometimes a precision and sometimes they're a variance. The effective parameters can be uh, uh, like a canary in, I was going to say a canary in a landmine, a canary in a, in a coal mine. Uh, really sort of a, a finicky yet important indicator that something has gone wrong with our product. Now, I'm going to flip back to um, the BRMS package because I want to show you the WAIC. Um, interestingly, the team that uh, manages STAN and BRMS is a, um, uh, essentially a, a wrapper or a GUI into STAN. They are, they are um, quite against DIC as the as the information criteria, and so um, they have made it very difficult to uh, sort of output the DIC from one of their models. So to demonstrate the WAIC, the one that's fully Bayesian, I'm going to run um, BRMS. Now, of course, there is a way to compute the WAIC from inside of JAGS, but for now, I will just sort of um, focus on uh, understanding uh, what kinds of things affect our Bayesian information criteria and how to compare. So we're still back to the Heights example, nice and simple example because we're focusing on information criteria, reasonable priors. This first model is just includes weight. So let me just remind us what that looks like. All right, I'm getting great everything, our hats, uh, effective sample size. If I plot my output, I'm gonna get chubby caterpillars. Um, yep, <clears throat> I've set my color scheme to Viridis. Uh, I've had a reviewer recently tell me that um, uh, I should be using Viridis more. Uh, that is not why they rejected the paper, but uh, color schemes, people do pay attention to color schemes, apparently, pass it on as you try and publish. Uh, model number two, uh, I am including whether or not the person is male in the model. We expect that to help. We expect that to help because if I look at my coefficient, here is my coefficient for being male. On average, males are six and a half centimeters taller than females. Um, my credible interval comfortably excludes zero. And so I expect that it is a helpful variable. So I fully expect that the WAIC of my second model, FIT2, is lower than the WAIC of my first model, FIT1. What I don't know about, and by the way, these are just the adults over 18, if you're, if you're following along from last lecture, what happens as I add a squared weight variable? Well, if I take a look at what's going on, here, my squared weight variable, the posterior median is very near zero. In fact, um, the credible interval almost is centered at zero. So I don't expect that a squared weight variable will be helpful in a predictive sense. So I'm expecting that fit that my second model beats my first model in terms of WAIC, but my third model does not beat the second model in terms of WAIC. I will note that it is entirely possible that a coefficient will be significant, but the WAIC may not be better, and vice versa. It could be that a coefficient is not significant and the WAIC is improved. Those are two related, but not even close to identical questions. So I'm specifically highlighting this as an important difference. A coefficient. Uh, either including or excluding zero in its credible interval, yes, it's somewhat connected to the difference in WAICs, but don't uh, think that, it, that the link is, uh, you know, the correlation is something like 90%. It's not, it's less than that. You know, information criteria are easy to get. So here I'm just grabbing the WAIC of the first model, the second model, the third model, uh, so that I can print them out nicely. I just put them inside of an object. So here is the WAIC uh, output of my first model and the second model. This is the raw goodness of fit. Notice it has a standard error because it's a sum of n things. Here is the effective number of parameters. Notice it 
two has a standard error because it's a sum of n things. It's telling me that I'm trying to estimate 3.1 parameters. If I go back to model one, I'm estimating an intercept, a coefficient for weight, and a residual standard error. Don't forget the residual standard error. So 3.1 with a standard error of a half, I'm quite comfortable with that. That is great. I don't, I, I don't think I did badly with my priors. The rest of these are not interpretable. There is not a, a meaningful set of units according to which I can interpret the WAIC or the uh, kind of raw goodness of fit. But look at the fact that everything has a standard error. Here is the output from model two. It claims I'm trying to estimate 4.7 parameters with a standard error of 1.1. If I go to model two, intercept, coefficient for weight, coefficient for uh, being male, and residual standard error. So I, I, I hope I'm estimating four. It says it's 4.7, it's a little high, but still four is well within one standard error of my estimate. So I'm happy with this as well. If we just compare WAICs sort of in the raw, we get 2148 versus 2027, we would pick model two over model one. This is a, seems like a fairly large difference. But remember, oh, also look, it tells us that one of our variances, one of our variances was greater than 0.4. And so it tells us to be cautious. Um, it's only for one observation. If this were the case for, say, a third of our sample, I would be worried. It's for 0.3% of our sample. I'm not worried. Uh, I'm sort of uh, going ahead. Remember that I can compare WAICs and get sort of a standard error for the difference. So here I'm running the comparison between the first and the second WAIC. Looks like the raw difference is 121.06 with a standard error of 21.82. If I compute a, what Dr. Galvin would tell me is not a t-test, but if I compute a pseudo not a t-test test statistic, I would do something like 121.06 divided by 21.82 which is 5.5. So that is the difference in the WAICs between these two models is about five standard errors. Or the way I put it here, model two gives us a five standard error improvement in WAIC after we add whether or not the person is male. That's big, 5.5 standard errors, that's huge. Absolutely huge uh, on any scale whether or not the normal approximation holds, whether or not the T approximation holds. Um, no, uh, you know, we're not gonna go ahead and find the p-value right now and, and reject an all hypothesis, but we can say that we have about a five standard error improvement by adding a single variable. All right, we're gonna high five each other and we're, we're good to go. Model two is the way to go. Let's compare model two and model three. Here's the WAIC for model two. Here's a WAIC for model three. You can see that the WAIC actually increased when we added quadratic weight. And um, in that case, you know, if the WAIC increases, I don't even really care what the difference of that in that standard error is. Uh, but if I did, it's actually non-trivial, uh, right? Look, the standard error of this difference is 0.34, and the difference in WAIC is two. So that's uh, that's a fairly you know, uh, meaningful difference. And that is the WAIC for model three is meaningfully worse than that of model two. So I'm not gonna go with model three. A quadratic is not necessary. You may have noticed that I've sort of disregarded this warning that compare IC is, is uh, deprecated. And so I just wanted to show you that um, if we use this Lou underscore compare, we get essentially the same output and the same conclusion about a uh, you know about a six standard error difference in in between models one and model two and um, uh, you know a, a far smaller difference between model two and model three. 
this um, basically concludes uh, our information criteria, um, uh, a unit. It, it, I think I, I, I've said a lot. Uh, you guys are ready to, to fit some linear models and select one that seems most appropriate. Um, we'll, you know, look out for a homework assignment uh, before uh, the end of the weekend. And uh, yeah, thank you for your guys' attention. Um, hope you all safe. I'll talk to you later.